Let's pray. Lord, you have called us by name. You have reached out and touched us. You pour your grace upon us. You have drawn us here. And whether we are here in person in this place, whether we are uh, joining by television or uh, online, God, we pray. We pray that we will continue to know your presence here. We pray, God, that you will hear our words of prayer, our petitions. We pray that you will receive our praise. And I pray, oh God, that you have already begun speaking to us through the words of scripture that have been read and that you will allow your servant to stand in the shadow of the cross that you will grant the words that I speak are not mine but yours words that are heard are not mine but yours and in all things, O oh God, you are glorified. We are built up. And transformation and growth and change occurs. And your kingdom is built. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. When we um, lived in Ardmore uh, several years ago, uh, the church I served, um, uh, Asbury United Methodist Church, had this little bitty church, and, and the parsonage was right next door to the church. And, uh, and, and the school that uh, Haley uh, went to, Nathan was not yet in school, the, the school, the elementary school that Haley went to was directly across the street from the church. So I would walk Haley to, to school every day. We'd go through the church to get to school. And I could, I could come back and I'd sit in my office and I could look in my church office. I could look out the window and I could see all that's going on on the school grounds. All uh, the activities uh, that, that were happening. There were all kinds of things uh, that happened on the school grounds. If you don't live next to the school, if you don't go to the school and uh, when, when kids are there and just watch, you, you don't know all the kind of things that are going on. Teachers know. Teachers know. Uh, it, it's amazing all the things that go on in school. And occasionally things would get pretty exciting. I remember there was, there was one morning, uh, it was during drop-off. Uh, it was a busy time. Uh, and, and there were a couple uh, of parents, uh, one in a car and, and one walking their child uh, across the street in the crosswalk. These two parents got into uh, an argument. Uh, really, they got into a cuss fight uh, and about who was in the crosswalk first. And uh, this argument quickly escalated, and, and these, two, uh, these two adults uh, were, were, were screaming at each other, cussing at each other, and, and not even the principal could come out and, uh, and, um, and, and stop the ugliness. I went over. <laughs> not even the presence the calming presence of a preacher that you know and love could, could, uh, could, could uh, restore any kind of sense of decorum. Things had escalated to a point they were almost completely out of control when the police showed up. Not long after that, still in Ardmore, 
<clears throat> I had uh, I had been off running an errand, and I was on my way back to the church, and I rounded the corner, and it was in a yard in a in a at a home across the street from the church, close to the school. And I see a group of, I don't know, there's, there's five or six or seven kids uh, gathered up, and they're watching two other kids fight. So I roll up, and I jump out of the truck, and I, and I go over, and I grab the two combatants by the back of the shirt, and I get them separated. The rest of the kids ran off. And, uh, and then, and then my, in my best dad voice, I demanded... What is going on? And one of them says something about having something stolen out of a backpack or a, lock, or, or a locker. I'm not sure. The other one says something about being called a bad name. And, and, and in what I thought was a stroke of pure wisdom, got these two by the back of the shirt. And I said, I don't care. I do not care. Go home. And they went. A few years later, not in Ardmore, in Hobart, I tried to intervene in another fight. This time the argument was between coaches and officials at a little league baseball tournament. The worst part of it all, they were cuss fighting, big time cuss fighting, while they were standing on second base in the middle of a game on a t-ball field. T-ball, little guys, little guys. There was some chest bumping going on. There were F-bombs being thrown around. Little kids were wide-eyed. Mamas were big mad. I thought I was, thought I was, was handling uh, the situation uh, pretty well until one of the coaches uh, turns around and chest bumps me and says, and I quote, go preach somewhere else, preacher boy. I don't have a temper at all. <laughs> but I am very, very thankful that, that one of my church members, who happened to be a coach on another team, not a t-ball team, but a, a larger, an older uh, team, comes over and intervenes on my behalf, <laughs> preventing me from uh, saying or doing anything that would have been equally embarrassing or appalling. Mm. Mm. All that is happening in the world and in our nation, the, the actions uh, taken by government, the behavior of groups and individuals range, ranging from uh, I I embarrassing and uh, appalling to frightening and heartbreaking. All that is going on have me thinking about all the ways that we are so very willing to harm and hurt others. Throughout history, we have, we have learned how, with great efficiency, we have learned how to destroy people. Mm. And it's sometimes difficult for me to hold my tongue. When I see things happening, it's sometimes difficult for me to hold my tongue. 
Sometimes it's difficult for me to hold my tongue uh, as an attempt to intervene. But in my worst moments, I struggle to hold my tongue as a participant. And when I speak out, even if it is with the very best of intentions, my words, my words are not always helpful or loving. Perhaps, I don't know, I don't want to throw anybody under the bus, but perhaps, perhaps you can relate. And is it such a state of the world as this, as things are now, that we gather here in this place, either in person or online, and, and we get these timely but challenging, very challenging words from Jesus. Love God with your heart and your mind and your soul and love your neighbor as Yourself. And I have come to the conclusion after what seems like a lifetime of religious words, both words heard, words read, and words spoken, words chewed upon and spewed out, debated and argued to absurdity, I have come to the conclusion that it really does come down to this. Loving God, loving neighbor. And these are questions that I wrestle with. Do I, do I love God enough to wait? To wait for God to act. To wait for God to, to equip me to move and act. Do I love God enough to wait for God to reveal through scripture and through prayer, through study, the words that I, that I am to speak. Uh, to, do, to do more good than harm. I know my personal failures... Uh, uh, of, of faith and holiness have, have humbled me enough to recognize that if God's words come to, uh, come to uh, a hearer, you or anyone else, they speak to you in spite of me. It is by God's grace and God's grace alone. Is, is my love for God evident in what I say and do? I wrestle with that. And in the second of that just who is my neighbor when it comes to I think when it comes to the big questions that have, have faced humankind since the beginning of time I think this question ranks right up there with am I brother's keeper am I my brother's keeper who is my neighbor Neighborliness, at least according to Jesus, extends far beyond those relationships with people who live near us. Neighborliness extends far beyond those relationships with people who look like us or who act like us or who think like us. And when I say us, I mean me. I'm dragging you with me. 
Loving neighbor must include, I think, at the very least, something about respecting and recognizing the dignity of every single human being, regardless, regardless of whether that respect and that recognizing of dignity is reciprocated. We've got to do that, even if people don't treat us well. Have you ever, even for a little bit, you ever wondered what a community like that would look like? community or a society where people are civil to each other, where, where people are able to meet their own needs and, and care for each other. In Scripture, such a community is described. And in Scripture, there's a word given to that and a community that looks like that that does that is called holy holy at work at play at home people would be whole and they would treat each other <clears throat> like they themselves a desire <clears throat> excuse me desire to be treated People could, people could disagree without harming or hurting each other, physically or emotionally. In a community like that, people would not attack each other with words or weapons. And in a community like that, people could think, people could vote, people could worship or not without fear, without threat or of coercion, without ridicule, regardless of their opinions or their religious traditions. That community would be holy. And for Christians, for, for people, for people who, who, uh, who, who claim uh, allegiance to, who claim a relationship with Jesus Christ, the practice of our faith would be more, would be far more than sentimentality and then warm, fuzzy feelings our, our faith, our expression of faith would be, would be more than expecting God will grant us success and health and painlessness. Because some think that if we just say the right prayer, we get those things. That's not necessarily the case. Doesn't mean that we, that we won't be healthy and wealthy and pain free, but it doesn't mean that we will be. The practice of our faith would not be this, this rugged, individualistic, personal, something just between me and God kind of thing. Neither would it be uh, just an hour a week and only with the people that, that, that worship with me kind of thing. Rather, our, 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 our practice, the practice of our faith would be communal and it would be vibrant and it would be and it would be gracious and it would be life changing and it would be merciful and it would be active and it would be with all with all of God's people everywhere even if they didn't worship like we do like I do For the ancient Jews, such a way of living was understood to be commanded by God. In the book of Leviticus, along about the 19th chapter, I think about the second verse. You can look it up and tell me if I'm wrong. God says, be holy, be holy because I, the Lord your God, am holy. 
And this, this exhortation to holiness was, was, was codified uh, into a complex system of laws. We sometimes think of, of the law as the Ten Commandments. But the Ten Commandments were only the beginning. You know how many, you know how many laws there were? 613. I counted. 613 laws in the Old Testament covering everything, covering, covering every aspect of life from birth to death, from marriage to, to, uh, to, to social relations in the community, from economics and agriculture to jurisprudence and worship, from intimacy to hygiene to behavior, even, it co even those laws covered ethnic issues. And, and in totality, the, the 613 were sometimes referred to as the holiness code. Some of these laws seem self-evident. Don't lie. Don't murder. Don't steal. Some of these laws we want to follow, they, we, we, we really want to follow, they sound good, but we don't always do a very good job of it. Laws like take care of the poor. Laws like don't cheat your employer or your customer. Laws like don't curse your parent. Don't vex your children. <laughs> Don't commit adultery. Some of these laws we, we've even forgotten or, or we just flat ignore. Don't cut the hair on the side of your heads. Don't wear garments made from two different materials. And it, it is these commandments, it is these laws about which the expert, the expert in the law questions Jesus in our reading this morning from Matthew's gospel. Teacher, he says, what is the greatest commandment? Now Matthew suggests, he doesn't just come out and say, but Matthew suggests that he was trying to entrap Jesus. Maybe he was. I don't know. Maybe he just, maybe he just really wanted, wanted to ask a question. Maybe because there's so many laws, who can get them all straight, right? 613 of them. Maybe he was asking a genuine question. How's a person to understand all this? Because surely, surely in all 613 laws, commandments, there were some that were more important than others, right? I mean, surely a, a tattoo is not nearly as morally wrong as child sacrifice. And buried somewhere in all of those 613 laws, all, all 613 commandments, was one single command that Jesus said was more important than all the others. And that even has a name. It's called the Shema. It's a Jewish prayer that begins like this. Hear, Israel. The Lord is our God. The Lord is one. Blessed be the name of his glorious kingdom forever. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your might. And devout Jews, devout Jews recite this prayer twice a day. <laughs> Religiously, you like that? religiously twice a day morning and evening it, it and and the shema is well we can look at it kind of like um a jewish affirmation not unlike the apostles creed that we recite when we gather here every week and the shema reminds the faithful Jewish person of the single most important command of all of Judaism. Love God. 
And the second, the second most important law, Jesus says, is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. No commandments are greater than these. The two cannot be separated. To have one is to have both. To, to, to neglect one is to neglect both. You can't love God without loving neighbor. You can't love neighbor if you don't love God. Maybe you're thinking, preacher, what's all this love stuff look like? I mean... You know what we do to words. You know how we butcher the English language, right? Words come to mean things over time that they never meant before. We live in, the, in an age when the word love has, has become so greatly abused that, there's, uh, that we're not even sure what it means anymore. It's become for many people something soft and touchy-feely and, 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 and warm fuzzy, a, a pseudonym for those things that, that make us feel all squishy inside, right? But the kind of love that Jesus is talking about is not some warm, fuzzy, touchy-feely affection. Rather, it is intentional. It is it is uh, it is intentional, and it is it involves commitment. Warm feelings of gratitude may fill our consciousness as we consider all the things that God has done for us. But what Jesus is talking about is nothing less than stubborn, unwavering, intentional commitment. And we are sent out. You and I are sent out of this place into the world to do the things that Jesus did. Jesus sent the disciples to do the things that he did. We, 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 are, we are to go out and to put into practice what we have become at our baptism. And what we became at our baptism were disciples of Jesus. In the 16th century, there was a, a, a mystic. Her name was uh, Teresa of Avila. She sums it up this way. We, we are Christ's body on earth ours are the only hands and the only feet that Christ has now that is profound that means we cannot as faithful followers of Christ assume that the world is bad and then because the world is bad separate ourselves from the world to be uh, cloistered up in our own little communities of faith. Uh, some people have done that but we can't do that because Christ came to the world to save the world not to cloister up. But Jesus did and does command us to love. What if, what if loving our neighbors means that we stop and we listen to people? What if, what if it means we, we engage with the people in the world just like Jesus did? What, what if we realize that we don't need, we don't need to bring Christ to the world because Christ is already in the world? What if we began to understand that we don't and we can't change others or the world? Only God can transform lives. What if, what if loving our neighbor 
which includes our enemies. What, what, if loving, what if loving our neighbor does not mean that we have to like them? We don't have to like them a lot. We don't even have to like them a little. What, what, if, what, if, what if it means we don't have to have warm affection for them, but we are to imitate God in taking their needs seriously and then meeting those needs rather than trying to impose our will upon them. And if we can do that, and it's not easy, if we can do that, then we demonstrate in very non-threatening ways the love of God in Jesus Christ the same love that we've experienced. Here is the simple truth of the Christian faith. God made everything, even us. God loves and accepts people, even us. <laughs> And we did not have to earn our creation, our life. We do not have to earn God's love. And we do not have to earn our salvation. And nobody else does either. Can we stop putting requirements on people that we've never had to live up to. And while we don't earn God's love or grace or forgiveness or salvation offered through Christ, we can, we can accept it. We can accept it even if we don't earn it. And more than that, we can live it. We can embody it. We can demonstrate it. We can be that. For people, in our relationship with God through Jesus Christ, God expects that we respond to divine love by sharing it. By, 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 by bringing love to others in tangible, stubborn, gentle, intentional, gracious, unwavering committed ways. Love is how we fulfill the commandment Jesus speaks about. Love is the core of who we are because love is the core of, of who God is and what God demands. Our opportunity is to respond. No warm, fuzzy, touchy feeling religion will do. Only stubborn, committed, gracious, loving faith. And this is good news for us when it becomes good news for all. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Almighty God.